Yeah. All right, listen, if you have students from the 6th to 12th grade, you need to sign up for this camp. Yeah. We normally take our students to camp every December, but we're going to Fuge this summer, and it's going to be Fun. the best week ever. <laughs> I was wondering if I was the only one that caught that repetitive up there. But, yeah, how are you guys doing this morning? Yeah. Doing good? Um, if we haven't had the chance to meet yet, my name is Kitty, and I'm really excited to be up here with you guys this morning. We have an exciting day. Word on the street is there's tacos walking around. We got a whole bunch of seniors that we're going to recognize and get to pray over the 1130 service. Yeah. And then you got me. So hopefully, hopefully the first two will balance out this one. Whew. All right, so if you're new here at Church With You, we've been going through, we are going through the Bible in a year. We have this 2024 statement of Jesus wins all because Jesus is in all. And our theme verse for that is Luke 24, 27. Um, and if you guys want to go ahead and flip to that and stand, we'll read it out together and then get after it. Okay, in the beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in concerning, concerning himself. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for just leaving your word with us, this living, breathing word that applies to our life at all times. God, we ask that you continue to grow us strengthen us and stretch us and just burn your word in our hearts so that we know it and we can take it out and do whatever it is we're supposed to do with it, whether that's apply it to our own life, apply it to the people around us, to, to be able to have the courage to walk up to the others and know what we're speaking is truth because of what we're doing here in this church this year. God, we ask blessings through our obedience of continuing to stay in your word, and we will bring you all the glory and the honor. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys can be seated. Um, so we're doing the Bible in a year and we have these um, series out. And right now we're in pieces series. And I know, come on, all of us need a little, if not a lot of hope, yeah. of help, and of healing. And we're doing this, and we have um, our new reading plans are out this week. They don't start until May 13th, um, but uh, we're going over a hope and a future today. And I just wanted to show you guys this. Listen. Listen. This was our last reading plan. If this does not give you hope in your future and let you breathe a little bit. I don't know what will. Come on. And yes, this is the pro plan. It's only one line longer. That's so exciting. You're welcome. We can, we can pray. We can pray and go home now. That has been done. But um, we're going to be diving into Jeremiah today and talking about the book of Jeremiah. And uh, we're going to be cycling around the verse that most of you probably know Jeremiah 21 or 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And a lot of people know this verse, but a lot of people also take this verse out of context because... If you read this book and you're like, ooh, let me go to Jeremiah and read about some hopefulness, it's not going to be there. <laughs> like, this verse is it. It is all over the place. So we can take this verse out of context when we believe that God only allows good things to happen to us. And this is where we lose hope because we start to think that God has failed us especially when we get in those seasons where we're getting attacked at all these different angles. So looking at it in context reveals that this is a promise of relief to those who are suffering. Come on, you're going to have trouble, you're going to have pain, you're going to have suffering, but when you look at it in context, we realize that God's faithfulness transcends our suffering and that helps us persevere through suffering and walk into what God has promised for us. So we got to trust in the future that he has. So what does this look like in our lives when, when we're getting attacked by all these different things and we're, we're losing hope and we just got one thing after the other coming at us? 
Because the reality is, is that when you're trapped, you don't know how long you're going to be trapped, right? And so if there's anyone that knows what it feels like to be trapped, it's our boy Jeremiah. So after King Solomon dies, Israel splits and it's politically split. It's got all these moral issues going on and it's just a mess. And that's where we're going to pick up today. In Jeremiah 1, we're going to start with verse 4. So this is Jeremiah speaking. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, this is Jeremiah talking. I do not know how to speak. I'm too young. Dude's only 20. He's like, whoa now, get someone wiser. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm too young. You must go wherever I send you and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reaches out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. And he's like, okay, let me go get my kicks on and let's go. He put words in my mouth. I'm ready to go. Like Jeremiah's got that fresh faith and he's ready to go out and conquer it. He's got the word of the Lord with him. And listen, the Lord gave him stuff to say, but don't nobody like it. Nobody likes it. See, Jeremiah was told to call out to the nations and get people to repent and turn back to God. Isn't this us? Like we want to be good Christians, right? It's our, it's our job to go out and, and bring people, draw people towards Jesus, to bring our families and our friends and keep turning our kids back to Jesus and talk to them about our coworkers and just draw people back to him. Meanwhile, we're also having to um, repent and turn ourselves back to him at the same time. Listen, conflict comes with calling, man. And so I think Jeremiah did what we have the tendency to do, and he underestimated this whole nation and kingdom uproot and tear down, destroy and overthrow that came before the build and the plant. Because you just keep reading, and it, it gets pretty gnarly. It gets bad. And listen, he's 20. He didn't get to party. <laughs> he didn't get married. Like... He even has his own complaint section in the Bible. Did you know that? We're about to get to it. 20, verse 7. I got, listen, my youngest son made me a bookmark for my Bible. It's the Holy Ghost. <laughs> All right. Jeremiah's complaint. You deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I am ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out, proclaiming violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say, I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name. His word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I can not. I hear many whispering, terror on every side. Denounce him. Let's denounce him. All of my friends are wanting, waiting for me to slip. Does that sound like us? You know, you have those people in your life that you just know are watching you and you feel that, that pressure to succeed, that pressure of not failing. And then he tries. There's a, there's a couple verses here where he tries to like, you know, he praises the Lord, but he ends this section on why did I ever come out of the womb? Don't you have days like that? Like why? Why did I do this? And listen, you're not always notorious for a good reason. He had a gift and his gift just kept on giving, just kept on giving. He was a laughing stock, but man, even in his darkest situations, thrown away in jail, he was exiled out of his homeland, he was still proclaiming God's word. And 
it doesn't matter. Like he was still motivating the exiles to pray for the nation that enslaved them. He was, he was asking them to just keep going, keep moving, keep shifting. Don't give up because of fear and uncertainty. And that's where we are coming to this verse, Jeremiah 29, of hope and a future. And in our Christian subculture, we have a tendency to think that like a, like a nasty pit of sin is the only like pit we get into, if that makes sense. Like we think that if you're in a pit that we're actively running away from God and that we're digging in sin and that's where we end up in a pit. But I don't think that's the case. Because if you look through the Bible, I found that there's, there's three types of pits that we tend to get at. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. So I want you to pay attention to which one you're in or which one you have a tendency to be in. Because it's normally one or the other or even both, depending on what area of your life you're looking at. You're either in one or getting close to one. So the first one is you get stuck. You know when you're a pit, in a pit when you're stuck. This is where Jeremiah was in 38 verse 6. He was just sinking down into the mud, into this slimy, muddy pit, and he couldn't get out. He was faithful to ministry for 40 years. How many of you guys would consider that a success? Yeah. yeah. But leaders repeatedly persecuted him for proclaiming God's message. He received no acclaim. He received no love, no popular following, none of that. Instead, he was beaten and threatened and thrown in jail. So, I mean, if you take a step back and look at your life, I mean, I think, I think you guys are doing pretty good. You think you're pretty successful? No? <laughs> you here, right? You got here somehow, which means most of you guys drove here. You look decent. You know, you got some nice clothes. Your kids are making noise back there. I don't know what kind of noise, but that's a good sign, right? You did it. You made it here this morning. That is success. But it doesn't always feel that way, does it? It doesn't always feel that way when you have one thing coming after the other, and it's not necessarily one thing or one day, it's, it's the day after day after day when you're working so hard to provide for your family. And then something happens in your finances and it crumbles you, and it's just one thing after the other when you're, all you're trying to do is like meet the needs of the people around you and your family. You put out one fire and three more pop up and it just keeps going and all these little things are attacking you. And by the end of the week, in the, in the month, you just, you found yourself just slid down. And it's, it's really easy to slide down, but it's a whole lot harder to get back up. And the next one is, you know you're in a pit when you can't stand up against your enemy. In other words, a pit is a figurative grave that the enemy digs in hopes to bury you alive. And listen, it doesn't matter how strong you are or how much you believe, the enemy will try to isolate you. And he makes it personal. Like he knows that one thing that you're keeping inside. He knows it and he's going to try to isolate us and attack us and he's going to try to block you in a pit and block out the light because what is light? Light is hope and goodness and love. And going into battle is terrifying. We don't want to do that. And even if we do have this desire and drive to just fight them, we're unsure that we have the strength and endurance to actually make it all the way through. A lot of the times we end up giving up halfway through because it's hard and he does make it personal. And he has a way of just cutting off communication to where you become so confused and alone and defeated. So you gotta know where you'll be attacked. You gotta know it, whether it's your finances, whether it's an addiction you have, whether, listen, he knows what you have overcame in your marriage. 
and he's going to get you in the same way he's been getting you. He knows how to get the mindsets of you or your spouse and snatch it back into that old way. He knows how to spark words of hurt out of your mouth towards each other. He knows what you've worked so hard to overcome, and that's where he's going to get you. You got to know it, expect it, and protect it. Okay. So, you know you're in a pit when you lost vision because pits have no windows, right? And in the darkness, we can't see things that were once so obvious to us. And this is, this is one that I struggle with sometimes because I'm only seeing one way. And thankfully, I got people in my life that will be like, hey, back up a second. Look at this. Because in that close confinement of a pit, you, you can't see out. And so you can only see in. And that's when you start turning inwards and you get this nearsightedness. And that nearsightedness breeds hopelessness. It's such a hopeless place to be. And when you've lost vision of what your role of like a, a biblical leader at home is supposed to look at, like it will crumble you. When it doesn't matter if you're passive or more dominant in your home life, if you just go home and expect everybody else to do everything and you just sit down and zone out on your phone, you've lost vision of what you're supposed to be doing. Or you could be dominant. You could go in and be telling everybody what to do and still sit down instead of leading them by example and taking action, being present, being active in the home life. Maybe you've tried. Maybe you've put in the effort, but every time you, you try and put on the effort, you either get shut down or spoken down to. Because ladies... Man, we, we get in this place where all we see is our schedules and our to-do list and our feelings and all the running around we're doing. It's just cycling around in our head, and we don't see what others are going through. We don't see what our husbands are going through. We just see them going to work and coming home and not doing anything. Am I stepping on some toes here? <laughs> we're wrapping up marriage groups, so I got it in my head. But, I mean, if you go back, there's this, there's this book at the beginning of the Bible called uh, Genesis. And if you go back and look, like God, you know, creates all the things and he, and he makes man and then, he, and then he looks at man and he's like, oh no. <laughs> he needs help. That's how I read it. He needs help. <laughs> Let me make him a warm man. <laughs> Like, we're supposed to help. It doesn't matter what's going on or how much we do. Like, that is our priority. We need to help and figure out how to help him. He's not going to get any higher believer if we don't speak him up to that level. So what can we do? Because we're either currently living in one of these pits or we're getting really close to one. So in which ways are you feeling stuck? In which ways are you feeling backed up against the wall by an enemy? And in which ways are you nearsighted? A place where you might honestly can't even see it. You're blinded. I want to ask these questions. What pit are you in? And if you're in that last one, what have you almost come to like about your pit? Because staying aimed towards vision is hard. You got to have some steadiness. You got to have some consistency. You got to have grit with you. And normally it's something painful that turns us inwards and we start losing vision. And isn't it crazy how um, painful can almost transform into uh, familiar? And it can even become comfortable. And listen, it might have become comfortable or something that people just expect of you, but it's not helpful or beneficial to you or the people around you. It's not helpful or beneficial to your family. And it's not God's promise for you. And you don't realize it until you're out. Jeremiah 1, verses 18 and 19 
For see, today I have made you strong like a fortified city that cannot be captured, like an iron pillar or a bronze wall. You will stand against a whole land, the king's official priest and people of Judah. They will fight you, but they will fail, for I am with you and I will take care of you. I, the Lord, have spoken. And then I want to go to Jeremiah 31, starting in verse 1. It says, at that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they will be my people. This is what the Lord says. The people who have survived the sword, who have survived their pits, will find favor in the wilderness. I will come to give Israel rest. The Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with an unfailing kindness. I will build you up again and you, virgin Israel, will be rebuilt. Again, you will take up your trembles and go out to dance with the joyful. Again, I will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. The farmers will plant them and enjoy their fruit. Listen, this isn't just a promise to the tribes of Israel. This restoration includes all people that trust God. Are you just surviving in your pit? Or are you looking for favor in the wilderness? Because it's there. God has you a brand new and beautiful again. We live in a fallen world. So there's going to be disastrous agains. But there's also going to be divine agains. And in the world's eyes, Jeremiah looked totally unsuccessful, right? He had no money. He had no friends. He had no family. But he prophesied the destructions of the nations and the temples and the capital city. No one would listen. No one accepted it. No one followed him. And yet we look back and see that he was completely successful in the work God gave him to do. Like, can't you see Jesus in that? Like that sacrifice? In chapter 40, Jeremiah was freed and he was told he could go anywhere he wanted to. So he could have gone back to Babylon and had all the comfort and power he wanted, or he could return to his homeland in Judah. He knew what he had to do. He returned to Judah. He knew. Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called. The Lord, our righteous Savior. He knew, he knew, and you have to know too. God measures our success with yardsticks of obedience and faithfulness and righteousness. And if you're faithful in doing the work of God, you're successful in his eyes. Like you have hope in a future with God. You have hope in a future because of Jesus. And I want you to get this if you don't get anything else today is the difference between a pit and a grave is how long you stay there. Do what you got to do to get out of the pit. Jeremiah remembered the agains, and he knew. Don't let fear or comfort convince you otherwise. Don't stay stuck. Because if there's one thing I know about pits, Satan can't make you get in them. But also, God isn't going to make you get out. You have to do the work. You have to remember. Remember. I don't know if you guys, of course you guys, you should remember. The book of Exodus, when back in the days of Moses, uh, they were rushed out, all this stuff was happening, and they get to the Red Sea, and he does the staff, and it parts, and they get through, and um, then it crumbles and washes everybody else out. That's my short version of it. Uh, <laughs> What happened next? These women busted out some uh, tambourines and they just started celebrating. What? 
they were like rushed out, like why of all the things that you grabbed, <laughs> why did you grab a tambourine? Man, they grabbed it because they knew and they were ready to praise our God and celebrate him. And that's what we have to do. We have to be ready and know, listen, you have to, you don't have to fully understand it at that time, but you have to know and trust and cling to that. Know your pit. Be ready and willing to repent and get out of it. Listen, that's, that's what I want for us this week is to go out this week with tambourines in our back pockets. Not actual tambourines, that'd be weird. Um, <laughs> please don't bring them to church. Pastor Eric will kill me. Um, but, uh, but carry a tambourine with you and when you notice yourself slipping down into a pit and you catch yourself, bust that bad boy out and celebrate. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. It, when the people that God has put in your life and surrounded you with, when they tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, or if you have friends like mine, they just grab me and pull me out. <laughs> don't, don't get sassy with them. Don't get offended. Don't get sassy and offended with your spouse when they do it. That's the moment when you bust out your tambourine and you celebrate because they just saved you. They just saved you. You have to remember and know. And look, if you're in here and you've been kicking the buckets with your faith, like today's the day. Our God is a righteous and loving father and he has been pursuing you from day one. And it's time that you look up out of that pit and give them your heart. And if you've never done that, I wanna give you the opportunity to do that today. So if everyone will bow their heads and close their eyes, we're just gonna take a minute and nobody's gonna be looking around. Nobody's gonna call you up. But if you're in that pit and you're, you're stuck or you're getting all these attacks from the enemy or you've lost vision and you just don't know what to do, don't stay there. Don't be comfortable there. Today's the day where you can look up and give your heart to Jesus. And if that's you, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand on the count of three. Nobody's looking around, just me. Just raise them up where you are. One, two, three, just lift them up. All right where you are. Yeah, I see you. And you can put them down. And I just wanna say a prayer with you. Cause God, we need you. God, we ask that you always come into our lives and just forgive us. Separate our sins as far as from the east to the west. Make me brand new today. God, help me get out of this pit. God, today we're returning our hearts to you. We're returning our desires to you. They're yours. God, you are our almighty king. And we promise to follow you for the rest of these days. God, we ask that you continue to bless us in reading the scripture, to bless us in reading your word, to continue to give us wisdom that we're like Jeremiah, that, that when the opportunity comes and we're supposed to give you glory, that it just burns inside of us so we can't hold it in. Give us the boldness and confidence to just speak that out to others, to speak it over our own lives, to speak it over our families. And God, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.